They've been kind enough to let me make just a few remarks tonight, and I would like to point out something uh, about this recent debacle that we just had. And I think the fundamental issue for me for the takeaway is the problem that we've had as conservatives and Republicans for the longest time, and I mean for 10, 15, 20 years now, certainly since Ronald Reagan, is that as conservatives, we do not believe our own philosophy. Certainly that's true for most Republican politicians, with the notable exception of uh, Ms. Bachman, who's sitting here tonight, and who we'll hear from later on. But the fact is, the GOP leadership and all of the national level candidates, again with one or two exceptions, are victim of Stockholm Syndrome. The pop culture has beaten them up so severely that they are utterly unwilling to stand for what they claim to believe in publicly. They're, in, in a way, ashamed of it. Now, I think, I think that Mitt Romney was one of the best men I've ever seen. And I think... I think you could make a compelling case that as an individual man, Mitt Romney may have had the finest moral character of any candidacy for the president, going back to George Washington, a remarkably decent and good man, remarkably, astonishingly, and every week I got to know him better, I liked him better and better and better and better and better. But on some level, one of the problems we have is that on some level Mitt Romney didn't even believe his own, he didn't even believe his own life story. Again, I do not wish to criticize him, I admire him enormously. But I can give you an example of how subtle this is and how pervasive it is when I say that Mitt Romney didn't believe his own message, he didn't believe his own story, forget about the Republican Party story. For example, you would hear the press talk to Mitt Romney and they would ask a question along the lines of, oh Mr. Romney you're worth 200 million dollars, how can you possibly connect with the American people? Now, a candidate who actually believes his own party's philosophy would answer that question perhaps like this. Well, first of all, Ms. Crowley, <clears throat> I'm not worth $200 million, I'm worth $250 million. Please do not remove the $50 million from my bank account that I have worked very, very hard to obtain. I might point out to you, first of all, that every single one, every single one, of the $250 million in my bank account was given to me freely through no coercion. I'm not the government. I didn't have the power to take it at gunpoint through taxation. It was given to me freely in trade for value that I provided to other people. And people never trade down. No one trades down. So that means that other people in this country felt that I gave them more than $250 million of value in exchange for the $250 million I have in my bank account right now. I'd like to point out also that as you can see from my tax returns, which I released prior to running for president, that I've paid $60 million in taxes over the course of my lifetime. And I expect to pay quite a bit more than that before I die. So who's really helping the poor people here? Who's actually helping poor, disadvantaged Americans. I've paid $60 million in taxes, which have gone to entitlements, welfare, social security benefits, all of these things. Community organizers have paid precisely nothing. They hand out forms, but the forms that people fill out to get benefits are paid for by people like me. And now we get to the root of it. Ms. Crowley, because the real reason I'd like to answer this question directly is, the reason that I have $250 million in my bank account is because I and my associates have generated, we're able to approximate, approximately $5 billion of wealth for this society. $5,000 million is about the number that we've generated. Which means that the $250 million that I've kept is but a tiny sliver of the total amount of wealth that we've generated for everybody. People all across this country, thousands if not tens or maybe even hundreds of thousands of people, have gotten paychecks as a result of the work that we do. We haven't just given them handouts, I pay taxes so people can have handouts, but we have paid salaries, and that is people's car payments, and it's their children's college tuitions, it's mortgage payments, all of this is generated by the work that we do, of which I've kept a tiny sliver, which is $250 million. And the final thing I might point out to you is this. I'm running for President of the United States of America. This is the richest country in the history of the world. We have a nation for the first time in history where the primary health concern among poor people is obesity. 
I may have $250 million in my bank account, but I am telling you now that if I stand next to a person who's flat out broke, who hasn't got a penny, I do not live 250 million times better than that person does, not here in America. They have air conditioning, I have air conditioning. I have more rooms to air condition, but we both have air conditioning. They have a car, I have a few cars. I don't have 250 million cars, and the cars I do have are not 250 million times better than theirs. If I get hit by a bus, I'm taken to the same hospital as the poorest Americans, where I'm given the same treatment by the same doctors as the poorest Americans. I get the same antibiotics and the same medical treatment as the poorest Americans. And so the $250 million that is being used to demonize me as a person who's not an actual being but rather a vampire does not mean I live on a different planet than you. On the contrary, what it means is my entire philosophy is based on the idea that everybody should have $250 million and that's why I'm not ashamed to talk about my bank account. And you can hear it again and again and again and again. Mr. Romney, you have $40 million in your assets overseas and overseas accounts. Would you like to explain that to the American people? I'd be delighted to explain it to the American people. I'm a money manager. My job is to put my money in the smartest place on earth. So, I have $40 million in overseas accounts, including Switzerland and the Cayman Islands. And rather than talking about whether or not I have money overseas, why don't we talk about why I have my money overseas? Why don't we talk about the fact that the United States of America has the 40th highest corporate tax rate, where we used to be the lowest tax rate in the, in the world, now we're number 40? Why is it that we're not talking about the policies and the procedures that this president and this administration have put in place that make the smart play putting my money overseas? Why don't we talk about changing the rules so that money managers and wealthy people from all over planet Earth are putting their money in America like they used to? Why don't we have that conversation? No. We don't have that conversation because we don't believe our own story. Now, because I get up and talk in front of groups like this every now and then, somebody says, well, Bill, are you going to run for office? I say, no, thank you. I have no interest in it, none whatsoever. And, um, and when people say, well, you, 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 make, you make an interesting president, I'd say, yeah, there's no way that I could be president of the United States. I have no military experience. I've never run a business, for God's sakes. I mean, who could possibly clear that bar? The great thing about President Obama is he's actually left the, the presidential bar on the floor. Anyone can walk over that bar now. If Barack Obama can be president of the United States, literally anybody in the planet can be president of the United States. But just to tell you, I, I tell people, listen, I'm temperamentally not suited to be president. And I'm about to prove it to you. Because when I talk about the message and the messenger not matching, when I talk about our politicians in the Republican Party not believing their own message, I'd like to just give you an example of what that might sound like if you actually did in fact believe the way you say you believe. Uh, President Whittle, uh, please, please tell us about the events that occurred uh, around the consulate in Benghazi over the last week. What were you doing when you heard the news and what did you do after that? My response would be as president, well, first of all, the only thing that I'm more terrified of than answering that question dishonorably is, or dishonestly, is to tell you the actual truth of what I was doing, and if the first lady found that I, that I answered that question honestly, I would actually be more afraid of that outcome than the real one. But suffice it to say that the president of the United States, once something is known to the national command structure, the president knows about it within four or five minutes. The president is never off duty, the president's never in the shower, the president's never away for the afternoon. So five or six minutes after that attack began on Benghazi, I was fully apprised of the situation. My immediate command was to authorize the in-extremist response force that we kept stationed in Italy and have stationed throughout the world. They told me those helicopters take two hours to get there. I launched them immediately. They were in the air within 15 minutes. My first actual command was to talk to the chief of naval operations and ask him how far away our nearest carrier battle groups were. He said they were about a 22-minute flight time at the top speed of an F-18. I said I want F-18 Hornets over that consulate now. I want them 300 feet above the ground. I want them supersonic. I want sonic booms over that city between now and when those helicopters arrive. I want our people to know that we're coming, and I want those people to know that we're coming. And if we break every window in Benghazi, they can bill us. Now, you called the result a debacle. Yes, it's absolutely true. When our helicopters arrived on the scene, we were too late to save that ambassador. We were too late to save those brave SEALs that died. An RPG shot down one of our helicopters and 14 SEALs were killed in the rescue attempt and it was called a catastrophe and a debacle. 
It's a catastrophe and a debacle not to go. I do it again tomorrow. Our people around the world need to understand that when Americans at risk, America is going to come to their aid whether we get there in time or not. That's what a president who actually believes this stuff sounds like. Mr. President, Iran just shot at an unmanned drone over the international waters in the, in the Persian Gulf. Care to comment on that? I would care to comment on that. The Republic of Iran has been at war with the United States of America since 1979. We haven't been at war with them, but they've been at war with us. So, starting this evening at midnight, I am now initiating a new policy. Please listen carefully. Of the 4,000 people we lost in Iraq, many of those men and women, most of those brave men and women, were killed by improvised explosive devices that were either planned by, designed by, supplied by, detonated by, constructed by Iran. So, as of midnight tonight, the next time that an American serviceman is killed, the Republic, which we can trace conclusively to Iranian involvement, well, the next time an American serviceman is killed, the Republic of Iran will lose an installation. Maybe an army barracks, it might be a patrol boat, it might be a, an anti-aircraft installation, but they will lose an installation. And for every American that's killed, they'll lose another installation. And if the Republic of Iran launches a terrorist attack upon American citizens, they will lose all of their installations. I will wipe their military off the face of the earth within 48 hours and leave them naked to their enemies for 500 years. Because we can. Because we can. My job as president is to defend our servicemen. I wasn't handed 14 carrier battle groups by the American people so that I could hold them in reserve against some day. That day is here now. We welcome the people of Iran back into the world, the ancient civilization, marvelous, magnificent, cultured people who deserve a lot better than what we've got. And when I say they're going to lose an installation, I'm including the general headquarters of the army, so you generals in Iran might want to keep this consideration foremost in your mind. <laughs> this is what it sounds like when you actually believe in the civilization that you claim to represent. This is what it sounds like when you believe that civilization is worth preserving. And until we can find a messenger who's ready to combine that with the message, we are going to be worried about things like paths to 270 and getting out the vote software for the rest of time. But when we find that combination, the entire year prior to the election is going to be time to have a margarita because the results will be a foregone conclusion. The only question will be, will it be a 45 state win like Reagan had in 1980 or will it be a 49 state win like he had in 1984? Those are the only questions that are going to concern us because our message Unlike many of our messengers, our message is unbeatable. Our message is unbeatable. Think about this. The Democrats and the liberals, with the entire bias of all of the news media, with all of the movie stars that came out, with all of the press that they got and then didn't get, with the media throwing their cloak of invisibility, a 30-point poll advantage on Benghazi and all this other stuff, with every single thing that they're doing right, and they're doing everything right. They're doing everything right. And then you look at all the things we do wrong, it's still a 50-50 country. It still is. How little do we have to do effectively? How little do we actually have to do right so that we never lose another election again, ever, ever? It's astonishing to me that we can be so bad at so much and they can be so good at everything. And it's a 50-50 proposition. Does anybody really honestly think that that means these two messages are the same? They're not. I'm going to let you at your dinner now, but I will tell you the difference between our two messages. The conservative idea of America is that we're a nation of steely-eyed missile men with our eyes on a far horizon. The future is unlimited. There's nothing we can do or not do. We have the power to vaporize a building anywhere in the world at our leisure. We have footprints and a flag on the moon. We believe in the power of the human mind and human creativity, human inventiveness, hard work, imagination. We believe that everyone should live like they have $250 million. We believe it's time for you to step off, get out of our face, don't tell us what to do. You have a right to live the way you want to in America. That's our message. And what's their message? What is their vision for humanity's future on this progressive left we find ourselves against? Their vision of a, of a future for America is a bunch of people sitting around in thatch huts, sitting around a burning cow pie, pulling parasites off of each other, eating their sustainable algae cakes, and having, you know, organic bake sales to raise money for the Guatemalan water snake. Are you actually telling me that these two visions are equivalent? Of course they're not. Of course they're not. I'm going to make a bold prediction here. 
A bold prediction. I predict the next president of the United States, I'm convinced he's going to be a conservative, I'm convinced he's going to be a Republican. But I'm going to go against expectation here and tell you that I think the next president of the United States is going to come from the pop culture, from the general culture. Because you cannot run against your own mythology and win, ever. When they own the mythology, we will never win. So our next president is going to be a man who can answer a question like this. Mr. President, please tell us about your opinion on the Second Amendment. And a president who comes from the pop culture will be able to turn to the people of this country and say, well, the Second Amendment is the document that allows me to carry this handgun right here. I have this handgun so that I can kill bad guys. And if you don't think that's important, next time you go to the next James Bond movie, you imagine him going on that mission armed with a sternly worded letter from the United Nations. That's why we have a Second Amendment. Enjoy your dinner, and we'll see you a little bit later on tonight.